Ooh, all right. So we did parallax last time. So tell me, where are the limitations of parallax? Right, we stars do. Don't move much compared to that. Stars don't move much. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you think about putting your finger out in front of your head again, and you flip your eyes back and forth, it bounces back and forth. If you put your finger closer, it bounces more. If you could rip your hand off and pull it way far away, it bounces less. So there comes a point where you reach a limit where you can no longer measure parallax. And it turns out that limit is hit pretty quickly. You'll notice when we download the data in Hipparchus, uh, the Hipparchos data, which did this with a space-based telescope, uh, how far away this really isn't when we get down to it. Um, and in Hipparchos, what were the baselines? Do you know what Hipparchos was doing? It was looking at stars with one eye and then looking at stars with another eye, but what was, which, co what correspond to what eye? It's a single telescope. Not the side of the planet. The side of the planet. In orbit. The side of the orbit. Yeah, so what it did is it took data That is on tape. Uh, so we, we, now you guys are going to start making your ringtones go up. I can't, I can't help it when I hear music, I have to dance. Uh, so you take, the, take one picture when you're on one side of the orbit, and then you go around the sun and take a picture when you're on the other side. So that gives you a two astronomical unit baseline, right? Really one astronomical units because you, you're only using half the, half the circle. But you get that full measured angle. You take the half angle, take the distance, you get the parallax. And so when you do that, uh, the, the distance that you can measure, we can write down the parallax, and this was derived in your book earlier, but the parallax is usually written as pi in arc seconds, uh, equal to 206.265 divided by the distance in AU. And what that really is, is there's 2,665 astronomical units in one parsec. So you could really write this as 1 over d in parsecs, where a parsec is 206265 astronomical units. Okay? So a parsec is named as a parallactic arc second. So it's a parallax angle of one arc second is one parsec. It's a measure of distance. Uh, you all know Star Wars, right? Han Solo, how long did it take him? How, he made the Kessel Run in, do you remember? Less than, I think it was 12. Anyway. Let's say less than 12 parsecs. The, the actual distance was 18. So what did he do? He went through hyperspace. Yeah, so he made the distance shorter. But he was not talking about time. It sounds like he is. Oh, I made the Kessel run in 12 parsecs. No, he's talking about distance. So one parsec is about uh, 3.2 or 3.2 light years. And so what that means is that a star at one light year has a parallax angle of one arc second. One arc second is one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. So our nearest star has a parallax that is almost unobservable from the surface of the Earth. You can do it if you have a really nice, really still, dark sky. Right? So the Hipparchos satellite uses, um, uses space-based telescopes to get rid of the atmosphere and also space-based telescopes because you can get a large baseline and a nice stable platform to do this. So uh, if you go out even further, um, you'll find out what the resolution of the Hipparchos data is uh, on Tuesday, but you don't go out that far, right? And I'm not going to give away how far you go out because I want you to look at the Hipparchos data, but you don't go out that far. Even the nearest stars barely move. But you can measure them. So this gives us distances. And I guess the, the upshot of the distance argument is that distances are really hard to find. So this is rare that we know a distance to a star. But we know the distances to enough stars that we can say something about their properties. So we're going to use that entire Hipparchos data set, which is you know, 100,000 stars or whatever, to uh, analyze the properties of stars as a sample, but recognize that it's a sample of nearby stars. So if the stars near us are weird, it's not a very good sample. right? And so it's possible they're weird. The other thing we're going to find out today is that the masses of stars can only be determined from binary star systems. So if binary star systems are different in their fundamental processes than single star systems, then we have a biased sample. So we have to keep that in mind. OK, so that's distance. Um, once, we, uh, once we know the distance, we can determine the actual luminosity of the star. Before we know the distance, we can only measure its brightness. So we have this, this difference between apparent, uh, apparent brightness 
apparent brightness and something we call luminosity. Luminosity is intrinsic, so if I have a 60 watt bulb, that's its actual energy output. But if the light bulb is located in Las Vegas, it's very dim. That's its apparent brightness. Okay, so to couple these two things together, you need to know distances. Except for, uh, well, we'll get to that later. There are ways to, to, to infer the distance if you know other properties of the star based on what we're going to learn on Tuesday. Okay, so let me write down um, the relationship between luminosity and apparent brightness. So let's take the case of the sun. The luminosity of the sun is 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts. So that means it puts out 3.8 times 10 to the 26 joules every second, which is crazy. Remember what's the total energy usage of the Earth's uh, instantaneous energy uses of the Earth is like 10 to the 14 watts for humans. So the, all of the energy coming out of the sun is a staggering amount of energy. Um, the flux, though, depends on the distance away from the star. So the flux, which has units of watts per square meter, depends on the distance away. So I have to take the luminosity of the star and divide it by the sphere's area over which it is spread. So as, we, as the sphere gets bigger, as we get further out, uh, the, flux of the, surface, uh, the flux of the surface of that sphere re gets reduced. And so in other words, as you put the star further away, it gets dimmer. Right? And at the Earth's distance, so if I were to set r equal to one astronomical unit, the flux is about 1370 watts per square meter, top of the atmosphere. So is that a lot of energy or not? Well, put a, let's put it in perspective. If I put out a square meter of stuff at the top of the atmosphere, I'm getting effectively 13 100 watt bulbs of instantaneous energy. So that's about as much as a hair dryer. 15, 1,500 watts is a hair dryer. Which sounds like, oh my gosh, that's not very much energy. It's an enormous amount of energy because hair dryers take a lot of energy. You have no, much, you have no idea how much this saves me in energy <laughs> by not having to blow dry my hair. It's, yeah, don't. It's a lot of energy, right? In fact, there was this, <laughs> there was this guy in South Ogden who was trying to put up a wind turbine. 1.5 kilowatt wind turbine. When you say it like that, it sounds like a lot of energy. 1.5 kilowatts. Right? It is a lot of energy, but the newspaper said enough to power a hair dryer. Yes, continuously, 24 hours a day if the wind is blowing. <laughs> In fact, you could just take the hair dryer and blow it on the wind turbine. And, no, it doesn't, work, it doesn't work that way. But the funny thing is, is that the hair dryer takes a lot of energy. You only use it for a few minutes a day, right? But 1.5 uh, kilowatts is a lot of energy. Um, to put that into perspective, our solar array is 4.4 kilowatts, right? That only getting six hours of sunlight a day at various angles, so it's only peaks at 4.4, averages six hours, gives us all the energy we need. So it's kind of a lot of energy, even though it doesn't seem like so much. Now if you average it over the entire surface of the Earth and add it all up, multiply that by four, by pi r, or four pi r squared for the surface of the Earth, that's what you get in energy during the day. That's a lot of energy. Uh, but stars, however, are even further away. Right? So what is the flux of, say, Vega? Can we calculate the flux of Vega? Well, somebody's got a computer open. What's the velocity of Vega? Zero. The flux of Vega is pretty close to zero. Yeah. So what, somebody tell me what the luminosity of Vega is. We're going to use this later in a calculation, so we need to know this. Huh? You have a computer. Or, or you have your, 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 pay, your, uh, your, uh, Okay, 40 solar luminosities. Okay, and what's the distance to Vega? 7.76 parsecs. Okay, 7.76 parsecs. So somebody calculate for me, all of you calculate for me, a flux of Vega in MKS unit. So what is that? So you've got the luminosity, you've got the flux, or you've got the distance. We'll call this R, just to be consistent. So what's the flux? And I'll give you a hint. My solar panels don't notice when Vega goes overhead. <laughs> it's just nothing. Flat lines. 
what's the distance of a light year? Uh, in meters, well, uh, it's uh, 3.8 meters per second squared times a year. <laughs> Three times. So would you? So what? The distance? What is it? Well, one light year. Okay. Or c times one year. That sounds about right. Anybody else want to confirm that? Don't have a calculator. Aren't we all connected to the internet? Don't need calculators. That's right. Well, we got to get one confirming. Ten to the minus eight sounds about right to me. But the parsec button. The parsec button. Well, it's funny because this. So a couple of things you might want to hold in your head. Do you know how many seconds there are in a year? Pi to times 10 to the 7. Pi times 10 to the 7, right? So this is equal to 3 times pi times 10 to the 8 times 10 to the 7, which is 9 times 10 to the 15. I got that. You got that? OK. So the flux is well, how many orders of magnitude? 11 orders of magnitude smaller than the sun. Yeah. Uh, or, yes, smaller than the sun. Go for it. Why is it that we take a solar panel and move it much, much closer to the sun? It's that's a great idea. The yeah, yeah, the, yeah, that's absolutely true. And the only. Yeah, oh, that would really work, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. The only trick is how do you beam the energy back to where you want to use it? With a massive microwave. With a ma just roast everybody. Yeah. yeah, so if you've ever played the new versions of. Uh, so, isn't that, don't they have that in SimCity now? Where they have the, you can put in a microwave energy transmitter, and that if the if the beam gets offline by a fraction of a radian or something, it fries your whole town. Well, they have that yeah. in space too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, so okay, sufficiently intelligent species. Here you are. One of the ideas that people have is to build a sphere of solar panels around it, an otherwise unused star, right? We gotta get there first. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then you harvest that energy. So one of the things you could do is you could you could build a Dyson sphere, is what these called, around Vega, such that it uses 40 times the solar or 39 solar luminosities, but emits one solar luminosity in infrared radiation, and then you put a sun as planet there and live there comfortably. We should totally do that. All right. So. You're going to need this later. Write this down. The flux of Vega. OK. You work out the energetic. It's an engineering problem, right? Physicists say you can do that. Yeah, you just have to work out the engineering. OK, so this gives you just kind of a range. of. You've seen the, the star Vega is one of the brightest stars in the sky. Can anybody tell me what the magnitude of Vega is? Let's, let's write that down. What's the, now, we need to talk about magnitudes here, but I'm just going to write down the apparent magnitude of Vega. Vega. Uh, I think it's like it's either one or zero, or somewhere in between those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that where all magnitudes? Capella is zero, I think. Or no, Capella is minus two. I'm sorry. Where magnitude zero point zero three. Zero. Uh, zero. Yeah. By definition, okay. That's what I was trying to get you to see. Okay. So let's talk about the magnitude system. Uh, Quite a long time ago, uh, Hipparchos, the guy that uh, we're going to be using all of his data eventually, <laughs> he didn't make the telescope, uh, came up with this idea of, uh, of magnitudes where, now at the time, uh, we've, we've adjusted this since and made Vega the standard, but at the time he just said the, the brightest stars in the sky of order are one first magnitude. The next brightest star in the sky is two magnitudes. The next brightest star is three. And he made all the way down to the dimmest star you could see was six. And he just broke that up evenly, right? So he made classes of stars. So magnitudes uh, uh, in antiquity, the first magnitude was the brightest, the sixth magnitude was the dimmest. And then it went to three, four, five. So the stars you can see with your naked eye in a dark site are six. And the stars, uh, the brightest stars in the sky are one. Um, now, Vega's bright. We've defined that as zero now in modern times, but that's the way we did this. The problem with this is that because we have data from 1,000 years ago, we have to use this scale. 
for comparison. <laughs> but the uh, real problem is that it's an inverse logarithmic scale. But it's not just log base 10 or log base e. It's based on the logarith logarithmic response of the human eye. It's, it's uh, 2.5 times log base 10, if you must know. We'll get to that in a second. But it's not anything rational. It's just what he did. And so, so the two things wrong with it is it's a, not a standard logarithmic scale and it's inverse. Now, if you're a chemist, you're OK with that. The pH scale is an inverse logarithmic scale, right? Boo, I say the same thing. But they, they had the same problem. They had uh, acidity. It tells you how many hydrogen atoms there are. Right? So if the number of hydrogen atoms is 10 to the minus 7, then you take the log of that and your uh, pH is minus 7, but everybody hates minuses, so you just say it's 7. But then if you increase the acidity by making more hydrogens, it's now 10 to the minus 6, which is minus 6, but everybody hates minuses, so it's 6. So a more acidic means a lower number. Now, if they had called it the base scale instead of the acidity scale, but they didn't because that's what the musicians have. So we couldn't call it the base scale. We had to call it the acidity scale. So anyway, it's a, it's a negative. So the this upshot is that big numbers mean dim stars. And that's going to trip us up. Because you're always going to be saying, oh, it's bright. It should this, the, you know, bright minus dim should be a positive number. No. Bright minus dim is always a negative number. Okay. Okay. So some uh, in modern times, we've taken this out to 29th magnitude. That's the dimmest that Hubble Space Telescope can see. So I want to write down what this uh, magnitude scale looks like and how we calculate it, because that's what you're going to measure. And unfortunately, when we go and get the Hipparchos data, you're going to be dealing in magnitudes and color magnitudes and all sorts of things. So. Um, the way that we now define this, based on measurements that we actually know, is we say a difference in magnitude from 6 to 1, that's 5 magnitudes difference, that's equivalent to a difference in flux of 100. This is by definition. Okay. 100 ratio, like just the, the, the ratio of a flux. So we say that uh, F1 over F2 is equal to 100 if F1 has a magnitude of 1 and F2 has a magnitude of 6. Right? So the dim star goes on the bottom, the bright star goes on the top. The ratio of their fluxes, these are in real units, watts per square meter, is equal to 100. And so once we do that, we can derive a magnitude scale uh, because we can write down, OK, well, that's for, this is for a difference in five magnitudes. If I want to do a difference in one magnitude, I just say, well, it's F1 over F2 is equal to 100 to the 1 fifth. So 100 to the 1 fifth, that ratio of fluxes tells you the difference in magnitude of those objects. And if you'll work this out, this is uh, 10 to the 0 0.4, which is equal to 2.5 approximately. And so I can write down that the ratio of fluxes for one magnitude is equal to 2.5. Right? The ratio of fluxes for a single magnitude is 2.5. So if I take a first magnitude star and a second magnitude star, the first magnitude star is 2.5 times brighter than the second magnitude star. Okay. So that, the, the problem with that, though, is now we have a difference in magnitudes as a ratio of fluxes. So let me write that down. That means that the ratio of fluxes, 1 to 2, corresponds to 100 to the m2 minus m1 magnitudes, which is equal to, if I, if I take the log of both sides, take log base 10 of both of these, to take log base 10 of this, right? And work all that out. Oh, this has got to be divided by 5, right? Work all that out, I get that m2 minus m1 is equal to 2.5 times the log of f1 over f2. And these are flipped because this is a negative logarithmic scale. If we had called the brightest star 6 and the dimmest star 1, this would be this way. But we didn't. 
stupid. Yes, thank you. This is so dumb. This is the dumbest thing you have ever seen in your life. And yet, with 5,000 years of astronomical history, everything's a magnitude. So this is the general result for any stars? This is any stars. So let's do it for Vega and the Sun. So the question is, what is the difference in magnitude between Vega and the Sun, apparent magnitude? Right? So we already know what F1 is. Remember, F1 is going to be the brighter star. Uh, wait, no, sorry. Yeah, F1 is going to be the brighter star, so that's our sun, because it's closer. And F2 is going to be the dimmer star, because we we're going to get a ratio that's large. So somebody take for me 2.5 log of uh, 1370 and 2 times 10 to the minus 8. Well, I look at that, and that's 10 to the minus 11. Yeah? OK. So that means this is minus uh, 2.5. No. Yeah, minus 2.5 times uh, 11. So minus 22. The difference in magnitude between the vega, which has the small number, I mean, even I get it backwards. <laughs> Vega is 0, right? M, then, of the sun is equal to minus 22. Wait, did I do that right? Uh, no, I didn't. What did I do wrong? Oh, don't do this to me. 2 is the small number. No, this should be, right, this should be, right, because it's in the denominator. Thank you. Yeah, 10 to the 11. So there's no minus sign there. Right, so the difference is 22-ish. Well, 26. Yeah, and if you look up in your book, you're going to get about that for the, for the difference between the apparent magnitudes, which means the sun's apparent magnitude is like minus 26 because it's super bright, right? So on the apparent magnitude scale, that is the uh, apparent magnitude of our star. So it's just, it's just something we have to acknowledge that this is the way astronomers do this. Now, there have been lots of motivations to change this. Unfortunately, it just gets worse. Why don't we just define um, it based on the star from a certain distance and everything else goes off? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's what, real, that's what uh, radio astronomers do. So radio astronomers measure in real units the energy hitting their telescope per unit time. Uh, but they can get away with that because radio telescopes were invented in the 30s. And they could say, oh, well, we know physics now. So let's just say every radio observation is now in watts per meter squared. And they've done that. You guys should hire uh, some PhD candidates to redo all of this. Yeah, OK. <laughs> 5,000 years. It's actually not even more. It's worse than that. It'll be yeah. life It'll be life is great. No, it, and honestly, all you really have to do, right, it's not that hard. You get people to agree that from now on, we're going to measure them in real units. And then every time you read a paper that's older than 2013, you have to convert it. And then 1,000 years from now, everyone will be happy. But we're not doing that because of a thing called culture. Astronomers love this type of stuff. It's a historical connection to our background. And uh, it's something that I don't like about astronomy, but that's the way it is. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, it's kind of like that. OK, so we do, though, reference it to a, we, we, we now have to make a difference between absolute magnitude and apparent magnitude. So this is the apparent magnitude. This is how bright it seems. So the little m is going to be the apparent magnitude. And the uh, absolute magnitude, which I'm going to call big M, is the, <laughs> wait for it, the apparent magnitude as if the star was located at 10 parsecs. That's just by definition. Why not one? I don't know. Well, yeah, you would think, because there's this star there. <laughs> yeah, you would think, but we don't do it that way. OK, so we write down, uh, this, is, this is something uh, called the distance modulus, right? It is the. Uh, well, we're going to get to the distance modulus. If I take my ratio of fluxes, so I take the flux. This is for the same star. So I've got A star. And I'm going to ask, what is its apparent versus absolute magnitude? So then I'm going to take the star where it is. That's its apparent magnitude. If I move it to 10 parsecs away, 
That's its absolute magnitude. So I just write down uh, 100 again. Now my difference of magnitude is little m minus big M, right, divided by 5. And that's going to be equal to the ratio of the flux at 10 parsecs divided by the flux wherever it happens to be. <laughs> I am not sadistic at all. OK. But the cool thing about this is that all the units are going to drop out of this flux, right? The luminosity of the star doesn't matter because it's the same. 4 pi doesn't matter. So this just becomes the ratio of d squared, its actual distance, to 10 parsecs squared. And because it's a ratio, we don't have to worry about the units. We just put d in parsecs and we're good. Okay. So now if I go ahead and write that out, um, I can solve this for d. That means that d is equal to 10 to the little m minus big M plus 5 divided by 5. And that's because I take, I've got 10 squared here. I bring it over here, bring it in here, right? So I've got, and I, I take care of my little uh, factor of 100 there. And then uh, I can solve this for this thing right here, which is called the distance modulus. So I take the log of both sides, and I get m minus big M is equal to 5 log d minus 5. And this is called the distance modulus. And the reason we call it the distance modulus is because if I can measure the apparent magnitude of the star and measure the distance so I know the absolute magnitude of that star, right? Uh, well, sorry, I, what am I talking about? If I measure the, uh, or the apparent magnitude of the star and I know its absolute magnitude because of the type of star it is, I can get its distance. So this is a way to estimate the distance if you know what type of star you're looking at. So if I can find a sun someplace, and I know it's a sun. I know how bright it really is. I can compute its absolute magnitude. I can measure its apparent magnitude and find its distance. Was that minus 5 in the argument? No. This is a, these are added terms. Yeah. If the distance is 10 parsec, what's m minus m? Log of 10 is 1, yeah, 5 minus 5 is 0. Okay. So when astronomers calculate, think about things, they don't think about things in terms of parsecs. They think about things in terms of what's the apparent minus the absolute magnitude, because those are easy to measure. So if I know that the uh, you know, Vega's apparent magnitude is, what did we decide it was? 0. And I know its absolute magnitude is 6. Right? Then I know that 6 is equal to 5 log d minus 5. And I can throw in a distance and I can work that out. So it's a way that, uh, it's just the way that we write it. And the only reason I'm really showing you this is because when we go to the Hipparchos data set, it's going to list apparent magnitude, absolute magnitude, distance. Yeah? What is the So usually the way this goes, um, so here's, here's the way it works. So, and this is what we're going to do on Tuesday. We use parallax to find distance. Right? If we know the distance and we can measure the apparent magnitude, because that's just the flux coming into our telescope, we know the absolute magnitude. And then we can relate the absolute magnitude back to luminosity. So that's, that's the, usually the order it goes. But once you've got that, right? once you have a collection of absolute magnitudes for different types of stars, you can then do it the other way. You can say, oh, I found this star that looks just like the sun, spectroscopically. Right? And then I can use its distance modulus, because I know m and m, to find d. And so you can flip it around. So that's, the, uh, that's just the way that, that the Hipparchos data is going to do this. So are you OK with that, questions? They're, they're equations that are relatively simple to use. They are uh, kind of convoluted. The only thing you have to keep in mind, again, is that if you have a difference in magnitude and the number is negative, Right? That means that the, you took a, bright, a dim, bright star and subtracted off a dim star. Okay. okay, so we've got distance, we've got brightness. The next thing we want to talk about is how hot a star is. And this is going to drive you crazy too, because 
you know how to do this, right? If I give you a black body spectrum, whoop, which has brightness versus temperature, you can find, whoop, brightness versus wavelength, you can find lambda max, which is where that peak is. That's easy to do. You just watch for it to roll over. Calculate lambda max. You know lambda max through Wien's law. You can get the temperature. Unfortunately, almost all of the time, we don't have a spectrum because the star is too dim. <laughs> so we do have a spectrum, though, a very coarse spectrum, in the sense that I can take a star which is emitting as a black body that looks like this, and I can take a broadband data point here, right, and then a broadband data point here, and I can measure what's called the blue magnitude through a blue filter, right? That's called B. And I can measure the V magnitude, which is a visual filter, which is a little bit redder than blue. And then if I take B minus V, that gives me 2.5 times log of the flux between V and B. And again, those are flipped, right? Because it's a negative logarithmic scale. So I can get a difference in magnitudes at different colors. And that's called the B minus V color. And if, it's, if B minus V is, so if we look at this is on a magnitude scale, is this star brighter in blue or red? Red. Red. So on a magnitude scale, is the V bigger or smaller, the number V for the magnitude bigger or smaller, if it's brighter? Smaller. Smaller, OK. <laughs> yeah. So that means this is small in magnitude. This is big in magnitude. So if B is big and V is small, B minus V is a positive number, which means that red stars have a positive B minus V, and blue stars have a negative B minus V, or a smaller one goes into the negative scale. Yeah? What exactly does this tell us? This doesn't really tell us anything about the max. It, it, what it tells us, so it doesn't tell us about the max, but because we're taking a difference, we're getting a ratio of these two points. So it's effectively measuring the slope of this line, right? So if you have a B minus V of 0, that means that you have equal uh, colors in blue and red, and so you are at lambda max. So B minus V of 0 means you've just measured the, f the brightness at lambda max. Right? So this effectively gets you lambda max. But if you don't have it right in there, if this is sliding back and forth because it's hotter or colder, right? you get the slope of that line. And the slope of that line is going to tell you the temperature as well. So it's a slightly different measurement. But empirically, you can work out, and I'm just going to write this down, that the temperature of a star is approximately equal to 9,000 degrees Kelvin divided by B minus V plus 0.93. That's an empirical relationship where we took temp no stars of known temperatures, and you could ask how we figured that out by taking spectra of them and getting the actual temperature, taking B minus V colors of those same stars, and then making a graph of B minus V versus temperature and then fitting a line to it. So it's empirical. But again, when we get to the Hipparchos data set, the measurements that are easy to make are B minus V. Because you take a blue filter and a V filter, and then you can get the temperature. Yeah. So I guess this is, um, I'm not sure if this is a good question. But do all stars peak around B minus V? Because this would seem more useful if you're peaking right near B minus V. So, Quite far down, this doesn't tell me anything. Well, it does. So let's, let's draw a couple cases. So let's do a case where. You've got brightness versus wavelength, and you're a really bright blue star. Okay? But my B minus V happen at the same point, so I get B minus V. Right? The difference of that is telling you the slope of this line. As you begin to go to cooler stars, right? this one's near the peak. The slope's very small. The slope changes over here. The slope of these lines changes as you go back and forth. So you can get information from the slope. Now, is it as good of a measurement as taking the spectrum? Not at all. But if you have a star that's at 29th magnitude, you cannot build a spectrometer on a telescope big enough to get a high-resolution spectrum to get that shape. So you have to rely on B minus V.
So it's not ideal. It's the closest. It's the closest we can get. Okay. But when you again with the Hipparchos data, you're going to see this. Okay. So let's uh, let's see where we are here. Um, we have covered how far away stars are. So we've got their distance. We have their brightness and luminosity. We have the temperature. Last week you did size, right? If you know how far away something is and you can measure its apparent angular size, you can get its actual size, right? So we can get the size of stars. Now there's a, an interesting thing about the size of stars. There's only a couple stars that we can measure directly their size using a telescope, a single telescope. One of them is the sun. The other one is Betelgeuse because it's so big. But most of the rest of them are used, uh, measured using interferometers. And what you do is you take two telescopes pointed at the same star, and then you have that signal come in and you optically mix it to interfere the signals. And then as the star moves over the telescopes, the fringes shift, and you can get the size of the star from that. So we can measure the sizes of stars uh, in that respect, right? And if we know they're, if we, uh, if we measure their apparent angular size that way. And then if we know their distance, we can get their actual size. Um, so if you've got all those things, though, you've got distance, which allows you to get luminosity. Uh, temperature is something that's directly measured. And size is something you can measure. You can put all these things together to get a model for what a star should look like. And that model is, we've, I think we talked about this before, that the luminosity star should be equal, if it's a black body, to 4 pi r squared sigma t to the fourth, where this is your black body spectrum temperature, and this is your area. So there should be a natural relationship between temperature, radius, and luminosity. Now the cool thing about this is that luminosity is relatively easy to measure, and temperature is relatively easy, easy to measure. Size is not easy to measure. So we can plot luminosity versus temperature and see what we get. Now according to this, we would get you know, all the stars falling on a line. But it turns out that different stars uh, have different, uh, different properties, depending on the type of star they are, which we're going to do in the Hipparchos thing. Also, okay. the Stephen Boltzmann constant changes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. The Stephen Boltzmann constant is different for different types of stars. That's right. That's why we call it constant. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this, the reason I bring this up is because on Tuesday we're going to make something called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram from the Hipparchos data. And Hertzsprung-Russell independently came to the conclusion that we should make a graph of luminosity versus temperature for stars. And the reason they both came up with it at the same time is because it's a pretty obvious to do, thing to do. <laughs> In fact, I wonder how many astronomers, I wonder how many undergraduate astronomy classes made a graph like this and just said, oh, hey, look, there's cool stuff going on, but never got their names attached to it. Like because, already did this yeah, picture. it's so obvious, yeah. OK, so the last thing I want to talk about today is uh, mass. So we, um, we have massive stars. They all have a mass, and we would like to know how massive they are. So how are we going to, we don't know ahead of time how massive they are, so how are we going to measure the mass of a star? This is the tricky one. Because there's nothing, if I just have a star hanging out in space, it's that old physics koan. If there's only one object in the universe, does it have mass? Yes. Really? Yeah, that said so. OK. <laughs> you can measure it for me. How are you going to measure it? With inertia. Right. OK, so do something to it to fi figure out its inertia. Spin it in a circle. How did you spin it? With my invisible hands. <laughs> right. You have to add another mass. <laughs> right? Yeah, but you're exactly right. If you can move it, right, you can know how much mass it has. But if you can't move it, there's no way to know. And so the philosophical question is, does it mean anything to even ask the question? Luckily, we are not in that universe. Right? We're in a universe where there are multiple objects. So if you have uh, one object and another object, they're orbiting each other. We know that Kepler's law says the period squared is equal to 4 pi squared over g m1 plus m2 a cubed. And that's going to give you the mass of those objects if you can measure the period and the distance between them. So this only works for binary star systems. It only works for binary star systems. So if you can see both stars, it's trivial, right? Because you look at it and you're like, oh, they have a separation, right? 
and then you wait for them to go around. You're like, oh, they have a period, and you get the numbers, get the, the get the masses. Yeah. Can you use Kepler data uh, using multiple planets to find the mass of the star? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If uh, no, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting because we can't see the planet. And we don't know, so what we're assuming there is that the mass, we're, we're, we're putting in a value for the mass of the sun to get the mass of the planet. So we study the star because we know that. In order to get the masses of the stars, you, you need spectroscopic information from both stars or visual observations. We'll talk about the spectroscopic in a second. Um, this one, though, you need another piece of information because these things, you have only the addition of the masses. You only know their total mass of the whole system. But you also know that any two stars are going to orbit a common center of mass. And so you can write down, uh, this is M1A1, right? And this is M2A2. Ah. And so I can take the ratio of that. And I find out that the ratio of the semi-major axis A1 to A2 is equal to M2 to two. So you can, if you can see both stars, it's trivial. It's, you just look at them. Of course, if you can see both stars, waiting for them to go around one full period is a, <laughs> takes a lot of time. So we don't really do this very often. The, the way we really do this is through something called spectroscopic binaries, where you can see both stars, but only spectroscopically. And so I wanted to give you a little uh, example of this. And I put on your, um, on your Canvas site, if you go to, where is it? Bum, bum, bum. Oh, it's in our pages. So I, I think you're probably beginning, except for Nate, email notifications <laughs> when I update these pages. But I've been putting uh, links uh, to all of the lectures here. And if I click on today's, you'll see there's lecture notes, what I've got up here. And then I've got a link to a spectroscopic binary star simulator and an eclipsing binary star simulator. So I wanted to fire up. Yeah, well, I'm letting you know. So, all right, this takes just a second to load. Whoops, what happened? Okay. It's running in Java. Okay. Like it's, all right, so what this is showing you here, and this, there's some instructions off to, uh, off to the down there. Okay, there's some instructions on how to use this. I thought they were off to the right, but they were off to the down. Uh, so what, what we have here are all the parameters. And there's some things I haven't included, like eccentricity, inclination. Uh, this is called the uh, argument of, must be the argument of the perihelion. Is that right? Let me make sure I got that. I wasn't going to worry too much about that, but I think it is node, uh, argument of the node. Okay. That just tells you when their orbits, it, it lets you process their orbits within each other like this. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Um, but it gives you the ratio, the, the two masses. And the, the, what we're seeing from the Earth is we're taking a spectrum of these stars. And we're looking at some absorption lines. And you get absorption lines from each star, one each. Uh, it, of, so let's say you've got a pair of absorption lines. Each star gives you that pair. And they're going to be red shifted or blue shifted, depending on whether they're moving towards you or away from you. So if they're moving towards you, they're blue shifted. Moving away from you, they're red shifted. And so these, this overlapping pattern on the spectrum is going to go like this. Right? And you can see that happening down there. And what we're measuring then is the radial velocity or the velocity towards or away from us. So the blue one is uh, the, uh, that's got to be the, the high mass star because it's, it's, on the, uh, it's closer to the center of mass. So you know this has to be the high mass one because it's closer to the center of mass. And then the low mass star is going to be the red one. And if I put these one to one, you should see symmetric results. Okay? So the radial velocity is going to tell us how fast they're going around. And how fast they're going around is going to tell you their period, right? Because you know how long it takes them to complete a full cycle. And the speed they're going around is going to tell you their masses. And what people do is they use these models with these equations for spectroscopic binaries uh, to put in uh, uh, data onto this model and get the masses, the velocities, the periods, everything. Now, a couple of things to point out, though. If I make the inclination uh, 0, uh-oh, uh -oh. yeah. You can't look at edge on system. You can't, no, you can't look on face on system. So yeah, this is inclination of it in the plane, right? So we're saying 90 degrees means 
the plane is pointing straight up. So in the plane is zero, and it's going like this, so there's no radial velocity. Right? There's no velocity towards or away from you. And so what you're really measuring is the minimum masses. Because if it's tilted in any way, right, then you've got uh, an ambiguity in the masses. So if I put this up to, this should go to 90 degrees, yeah, 90, and hit enter. That is the true mass of the system. And you see that these things, if I, if I back this off, if I know the inclination, those things get smaller, and I can figure that out. If I don't know the inclination, you just know the minimum mass. Um, if I put in uh, one of these things to be significantly larger, you can see how that changes things. And what, uh, what Braxton was saying is let's say I do a uh, planet. Can't see the spectrum of the star. So you're basically just, you have to assume the star's mass because you can't see the star's motion. Enough. Well, I'm sorry, I take that back. You can see the star's motion enough, but, but you're not going to see the star. You can see this stellar motion because remember, in a planet, you're not seeing the red one. You're just seeing the blue, but you're inferring the mass of the other star from it, not itself. Okay. So if we knew, if we knew the period of one of the stars and Kepler data, then we would definitely know. Right. Okay, so this is, uh, these are uh, spectroscopic binaries, and this is how we've determined the mass to every star we know. Um, there's another type of binary I wanted to show you because it's, it's cool, and that is an eclipsing binary, because if these things are big enough and close enough and in line, they'll eclipse, except unlike a star, unlike a star and a planet, you don't just get one eclipse. So let's show you that. And these are things you can just go play with uh, in your spare time this weekend, because I know you have nothing better to do than mess around with these. Uh, so this is a little, this is an even better simulator, I think. And what I'd like to do is make this, here, let's see if I can do this. System preferences, display. Let's go to, yes, confirm. Okay, this will be a little bit better. Okay, so what you're seeing on this simulator is a representation of the system. You've got the size of the planets, the mass of the planets, the orbits of the planets, and their inclination with each other and all that stuff. Um, what you're seeing down here are all the planetary parameters. You've got their mass, radius, temperature. The only thing I don't like about this is their mass, radius, and temperature doesn't change. If you change the temperature, it doesn't change the other properties, which it should because of that, <laughs> right? But keep that in mind. Um, I thought you said the stuff in Oh, right, right, yeah, that's the other thing. So it should list the, the change in Stefan Boltzmann constant. But what's cool about this is that what you're seeing here is just the brightness of the system. You can't see both stars. It's not a spectrum. And you can see when they eclipse each other. So if I uh, play this simulation for you, they'll drive around. And you can see that when they eclipse each other, you get a dip in light. And then they eclipse again, and you get a slightly smaller dip. And the dip is going to depend on the alignment, the size of the stars, the temperatures. You get the biggest dip when the hottest star is behind the, the, uh, uh, the dimmer, or the, when the dimmer star is in front of the hotter star. Right? So you can see that here, the blue, the blue one, the hotter star, the red one is the dimmer star, it's a cooler star. And then you go, whoop. Okay. And what's fun about this simulation, one thing I like about it, is you can, they have all these presets that you can look at. And they have all these examples. You, know? you can look at where you've got one really big star and one really small star. And you can see that you get a symmetric eclipse. right? Because, and they're the same temperature. It's just one smaller. Right? So you're just blocking out the same relative flux both times. Uh, there's a bunch of examples in here. But what's really fun is you can go look at data. And if I go down here, these are all binaries, uh, eclipsing binaries. And I'm just going to click on one. And you can see that there's little data points up here. And what people do is they take data of these things. They just plot it out. And then they use tools like this to figure out what the best fit is. So this looks like a very good fit. But if I change the mass of this thing even a little bit, what happens? Oh, it's not changed now. OK. If I change the mass a little bit, it's, the fit's going to change. But it's not, uh, it's not changing out there. Why not? Let's go to a, one of these things with data that I haven't fit yet. Yeah, more data sets. Where is it? 
mm -hmm. data, data sets with incomplete parameters. So I click on this. This is the data set, and you can fiddle with the values to see what matches. So what an astronomer will do is they'll look at this and they'll say, okay, well, let's think about this. I've got a deep peak when the star is in front, and I have a little, a kind of deep peak, about half the size, when the star, other star is uh, in front of the, the star when it comes halfway around. So the question is, what would I have to do to these stellar properties to make that flat line match the data? What would you suggest? Change the mass of the tiny little star. So which one's star one? Is it this one? Oh, oh yeah, OK. We've got to change the radius. Let's do that. Oh, well, there we go. Oh, look. Oh, oh. Hey, that looks pretty good. What if I change the mass? Mass doesn't matter. Why not? Mass should matter. Oh, right, because because <laughs> it's not coupled to the radius. Curses. This is not the best. So, but look what happens if I change this one. Oh, that's the mass, right? Forget the mass. <laughs> change the radius. Okay. Do that. So we can pick a bunch of these things. Let's pick uh, this one here. So let's change the radius. Those don't look like the eclipse. Yeah, that one doesn't even look like it's. Right, because. So can you change? Yeah, I got to go down and change the inclination. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So each one of these data sets is there's one parameter that hasn't been changed, and you can go figure out which one it is. So if I go to the next one, um, that's a good question. They, well, they have data sets for a ton of different stars, right? And I wonder, should this? Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, this is fun. This what looks like this. These will change, right? So you can go through and and fiddle with them and see how they match the data. Um, you can change. Oh, yeah, sure. Do you, we don't know what that is. I do. You know. <laughs> OK. If you show the HR diagram, it shows you where those two stars on the H, are on the HR diagram. And what's fun about that is if I then change the mass, should change where those, oh, right, those are the stars as they existed in the data set. So they're not going to change that. But it'll show you where all that stuff is. So this is a fun little tool. Uh, I just discovered this today. Otherwise, I would have built a whole activity around it, which I will do that for next time. But this time, I just wanted to show it to you. So we can find out a lot of information about stars from binary pairs. The problem is not all stars are binaries. So are we biasing ourselves by only studying the masses of binaries? Probably. Can we do anything about it? No. The only way we can do about it is if we send a probe, right? And to send a probe to these uh, stars would be really hard to do. <laughs> it takes 100 years to send one to Alpha Centauri. I think so, too, because 100 years from now, you'd be pretty happy if somebody 100 years ago sent it. Yeah. OK, so what have we learned here? And I, actually, what I want to do, instead of writing that down, because I want you to do that for Hipparchos, I want to do a little exercise. The last thing we haven't talked about, and the thing we haven't talked about is, what is how long do stars live? So we're going to do a little calculation in the last five minutes. I've got a question for you. You want to calculate the time, lifetime, of stars. And here's what, what's that? Six nates. Six nates, OK. Um, here's the deal. This is what you know. You ready for what you know? Get everybody get out a piece of paper and a calculator because we're going to calculate this out. You know the mass of the star. And we're going to do this for the sun, just for the sake of argument. You know the mass of the star. You know the luminosity of the star. And there, this becomes a kind of a simple calculation. We have to take a few subtle things into account, but it's a couple of uh, sim uh, uh, the most basic calculation you could do is figure out, well, the mass tells you how much fuel you have. The luminosity tells you how fast you're burning the fuel. So therefore, the ratio of the luminosity to the energy output from your mass should give you, sorry, I did that, the, the energy output of your mass divided by your luminosity should give you the time. So we know that the time scale should be proportional to the mass divided by the luminosity. But we have to figure out what the actual values are. So here's your hints. Inside of a star, we are getting our energy from fusion, which converts four hydrogens into one helium, and it releases E equals delta mc squared energy for each reaction. Okay. So my first question to you is, what is the fraction 
a fraction of mass converted to energy in each reaction. Okay, so that's the first thing I want you to calculate. So what is the fraction of mass converted to energy? And I want this as a, it should be delta M over M. Right, what's the total mass of each reaction? What's the mass converted to energy? So calculate that out. We need a periodic table of the elements. That one doesn't help you at all. And don't forget, four hydrogens, the mass cannot equal one helium because we're losing energy in the reaction. We don't. Yeah, but if we did, that would be called that would that would be a fission reaction, and that would go the other way. We would go high, high helium to hydrogen in that case, but we don't. Okay, so what's the fraction of mass? So what you're really calculating here is delta M over M per reaction, and this is a, just for a hint. This is the original reaction mass, four hydrogens, going from four hydrogens to helium. What is delta M over M for H? Okay. Fractional mass over mass is 0.7%. 0.7%. Does anybody confirm that for, for me? I can't. I, I, I believe you, but I can't accept one answer. I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. and I'm an empirical scientist. This is a religion. This is a, it is? You don't ask oh. questions. You're not showing me. Rash. <laughs> What'd you get? Well, I was just trying to remember the massive helium. Oh, yeah. Well, it's not four. No, it's not. Yeah, because then that would. It is four point zero zero two six. Yeah, you've got to, You've got to use the full the full value. So what what's the mass of helium? And what's the mass of hydrogen? One point zero zero seven eight two five zero three. Okay, that's probably too many significant figures, but. So I've got one get one one sorry I guess one accurate uh, a very well calculated value. Uh, what is what is this? so six zero two five? Yeah. Okay. And then I'm talking about the Oh, that's you. Yeah, you. And actually, that's three two five. There's a three Oh. <laughs> zero, zero three two five. Okay. Okay, what do we got? Yeah. Okay. We need a third or we're gonna buy that. So what it says is for each hydrogen, four hydrogens and one helium, point seven percent of the mass is converted into energy. Okay? Next step, what is the fraction? of mass involved in fusion. Is it the whole star? No. No, it's not the whole star. So what do we think? Well, it's a small percentage of the atoms in the, the nuclei in the interior. Right. So, like, can we assume it's just the core itself? Just the core itself. But is it only a fraction of the mass of the yeah. core, or do we have to do a fraction of the mass? Uh, well, so, so we don't know the answer, right? Because it could vary for stars, so we're just trying to come up with a reasonable value. Let's remove fractions, it's just the mass of the star. Okay, but, so let's, let, let me do it another way. Let's say that the mass of the core, let's, yeah, right. So we would want to say that the fraction is going to be the mass of the core divided by the mass of the star, right? So let's call that 10%. That's about right. If you. Very, it varies star to star, but let's just say for the sake, it's not, it's not half and it's not 1%. Right, so order of magnitude looks pretty good. So now, the next thing I want to ask you, now that you know that, is what is the total energy capacity of this star in its lifetime in, in joules? How much energy could this thing produce in total? How would we calculate that? So we want, we want number three, we want the total energy but we don't know how long it's going to live. That's what we're trying to find out. Oh, right. Yeah. So would we use that equation to find? So this is the this is all this is the energy budget of the of the star. How much energy can it produce okay. overall time? Fraction, you're right, you're to this 
Right, so we've got the mass of the star times 10% is the core. In the core, 0.7%, right? So 0.1 times 0.7 times the mass of the star is going to tell us the, the, the mass that's converted. And then how do we get energy? It's going to be, yeah, the percentage, which is this times this times the mass of the star. But then how do we convert that into energy? Well, we have to take into account when helium goes to... We're, we're just doing the main sequence lifetime. So yeah, it's a good question. So the birth factor when U is... Well, let me get... I think I wrote it up here. Remember energy and mass conservation. So... If I know the mass that is available to fuse, how do I calculate the energy? Multiply by c squared. Okay, so this becomes 0 0.1 times 0 0.007 times the mass of the star times c squared. Right, but what we're doing here is we're just we're going to use the mass of the star as the as the thing that has the units of mass, and then we're just going to say there's this much mass available, of which 10% is available for fusing. In fusing, only 0.7% gets converted into energy, and then we just it's all just fractions of the star mass. So the mass of the the kilograms is being carried by the star mass, so we don't have to worry about converting it. That's why we do it this way. It's really unintuitive to think of energy in terms of kilograms. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But that's the way we have to learn how to do it, because that's what Einstein said. <laughs> right, except, can, what's the star's mass in, in, in MEV? Right, so let's just do, since we already know it in kilograms, <laughs> just do it this way. Because at some point you have to put the C squared in, right? Because we don't know what the star's mass is in MEV. So... We already know what the star's mass is. The solar mass is, what is the solar mass? M sun for the star that we're talking about is uh, 2 times 10 to the 30, right, kilograms. Uh, so 10% of that is 2 times 10 to the 29. 0.7% uh, of that is, yeah, 0.1%. So that's, anyway, let's just calculate it out. Okay, what's the total energy? Calculate it out. Give me 0 0.1 times 0 0.007 times 2 times 10 to the 30th. What is that number? That's the total. Don't we have times that by c squared? Times c squared, thank you. I got 1.25 times 10 to the 44. Sounds good. Joules, that's the total energy output of the sun. Holy moly, right? So now, once we have the total energy capacity of the sun, how are we going to figure out its lifetime? How much it's burning. How yeah, how fast it's burning. So we know, right, this is really proportional to energy divided by luminosity, right? So if I take this, the luminosity of the sun is, what did we say? 0.8 times 10 to the 26 watts. So go ahead and throw that in there. What do you get for the time scale? If we divide 10 to the 44 by 10 to the 26. What do we get? All these calculators suddenly showed up. Okay, so 3 times 10 to the 17. I love that number. Seconds. How many years is that? I would, I would, I just did that in my head. That's fine. How many years, how many years is that? A lot. 10 to the 10. 10 to the 10. 10 to the 10. Yeah, because there's pi times 10 to the 7 seconds in a year. Pi is 3, according to the Bible, as we discussed last time. So 3 times 10 to the 17 is 10 to the 10, right? So the sun is going to live for 10 to the 10 years. So it, oh. not exactly equal. What's that? So it's in this case, this, this should say equal to. Okay. So we can write this down by the, all of these things still hold the 0.1, the 0 0.007. The only thing that changes is the mass of the star, right? So if you take the mass of the star, 
So we can make a ratio now. We can say, because that's a ratio, we can say that the time scale is proportional to the mass of the star divided by the luminosity of the star. So the time scale of the star relative to the time scale of the sun is equal to the mass of the star over the luminosity of the star divided by the mass of the sun over the luminosity of the sun. That's equal to the mass of the star over the mass of the sun, right, times the luminosity of the sun over the luminosity of the star. So we can ask now, what is the time scale for Vega? So we decided before that Vega was 40 times the luminosity of the sun. Didn't we decide that? So this is 1 over 40. What's the mass of Vega in solar masses? Up here. What's the mass of Vega in solar masses? Mass, Vega, solar. Can you say It's two solar masses. Oh, I got, uh, more than three is what I got, but do you think do you, we'll go with two? It doesn't matter. Order of magnitude. So we say it's Vega has got to be more than two solar masses. Oh yeah. Oh no, I guess that yeah. Okay, I buy that. Okay, so this is two over one. So the lifetime is going to be two divided by forty, which is one divided by twenty, which is. 120th. 120th, which is, what is, one, what is 120th? 120th is half of 1 tenth, so it's 0 0.05. 0 0.05 times 10 to the 10 is 500 million years. Right? Did I do that right? So Vega's lifetime, the lifetime of Vega, Tau Vega, is 500 million years. Life of the sun is 10 to the 10. What do you think the lifetime of a low mass star is? Much higher. Much, much higher. In fact, it can be 10 to the 11. Well, not quite, yeah. Well, no, I'm sorry, their lifetimes, yeah, it can be significant. They can be 100 billion years. They just haven't, we haven't had that much time in the universe yet. There are red dwarf stars out there that have, that are as old as the universe. We don't really know where they are yet, <laughs> but they're out there. And certainly there are red dwarfs out there that will live for 100 billion years. That's one of the reasons why we're so fascinated about red dwarf stars as far as life is concerned. Because if you can get life on this planet in 5 billion years, and then we're already looking down the pipe to see the sun expiring in another 5, we're done. But if you can get life in 5 billion years and then have another 95 billion years in which to do stuff, that's pretty cool. Okay, so it's a neat thing that you can do with these with all this stellar data. And what we're going to do on Tuesday is download this whole mess. We're going to all of it, and we're going to construct the single most important diagram. Did you do this in 2040 with the Hipparchos? Start on the HR diagram. Yes. But did you do it with the Hipparchos data? No, we didn't. We just kind of what did we use? We used a bunch of sample. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't, you're gonna, no, we didn't actually okay. go online and find the data. Ourselves. Okay, well that's, that's what you're going to do. So you already know the answer to this, but don't tell anybody. What's the answer? <laughs> What's the question? All right, so on Tuesday we'll meet in SL220. Good job today, everybody. You were all, you were all working hard. It's good to see you all. Look nice. All right, we'll see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend, and uh, don't forget about the homework that's due.